Well, of course, lots of people have been asking me why on earth I suddenly decided to write this book, which some cruel fellow said was the first work of fiction I'd written since the old election manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> like all good election manifestos, the story pivots upon one jump of imagination which the reader has to take. <clears throat> and that is the possibility of a dog and a human being able to read each other's thoughts so that effectively they can speak to each other. Although, of course, a dog couldn't conceive of this speaking, not got the right articulation of the jaw. What I find interesting is that since I completed writing the book, several people have come up with academic research which suggests that there might sort of be something in it. But of course, all of us who've been dog owners know that there's something in it. We know that our dogs know what we're thinking. We know that they may know what we're thinking even when we're not in the same room. <laughs> And if we listen very carefully, we can sometimes know what our dogs are thinking. They, I believe, do pick up the signals from our brains, just like an electroencephalograph, and understand them. But this book is about the tragedy of a young boy broken family, doesn't get on well with his foster father, he um, is unhappy, and one night he's in the car with his father coming back home from London where they've been out together, and there's a terrible smash, his father is killed and the boy is left as a paraplegic. And the story opens with the boy in hospital. And if you're wondering when you read the book why the surgeon is called Mr. Shah, I will tell you that at Stoke Mandeville I was extraordinarily conscious of the number of non-British senior medical staff there. In fact, again, I digress. I hope I don't digress too much and too long. You must signal me if I do. <laughs> On Christmas Day, 1984, I had uh, sort of discharged myself from hospital because I couldn't stand it any longer, despite a brilliant surgeon looking after me who said, the food's awful here and you've got to put on some more weight. I'm a plastic surgeon and I need something to work on. Please, <laughs> please eat the food. I'll help you. I'll order a case of red wine to be put under your bed for your convenience. <laughs> <laughs> but on the actual spinal surgery unit, I went back on um, Christmas Day to have lunch with my wife. They did it perfectly. It was the absolute traditional English hospital Christmas Day affair. The trolley, the turkey, all the trimmings as they should be, and the surgeons displaying their skill with the knife, <laughs> carving beautifully. <coughs> and suddenly I started to laugh, and one of the surgeons said, Mr. What's so funny about us? What's so, what's, what's so funny? So I said, it's, it's you. He said, what do you mean it's me? I said, well, look at you. He's a Jew. He's a Palestinian. He's a Syrian. I forget what the other one was. I said, there's not a goddamned Christian amongst you. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those wonderful sort of days. So I've remembered the medical staff there. And I've put myself into the boy's position. The terribleness, not just of being in hospital, but of leaving hospital knowing that your whole world has changed. 
And meanwhile, 6,000 miles away in Russia, there's the dog with his master, a Russian nuclear scientist. The dog has the enhanced ability to communicate because of changes which have happened as a consequence of high exposure to radiation. Some of his family were born with all sorts of other problems. But Ben has been born with this priceless gift. His father, his master is dying. He knows that Ben must be got out of Russia in case the authorities realized what gifts he had and misused him. So then the story is of how Ben gets from Russia to a place which actually exists called Canine Partners down in Sussex, along in Sussex, <laughs> um, where they train help dogs and the boy and the dog come together. Oh. With a wonderful variety of people, including a little old lady drawn somewhat from my friendship and acquaintance with Daphne Park, Baroness Park, who was a sweet little old white-haired lady. Ma'am, if you don't mind, her hair was as white as yours. <laughs> and she looked as kindly as you do. She actually spent her life in MI6, running their operations in Africa and Moscow, amongst other things. <laughs> and the boy, the little old lady, and another couple of characters discover that the car accident was not an accident, that the boy's father was murdered by Mr. Big in the drugs industry because he had penetrated that man's organization and he was about to reveal all that he knew. I won't tell you anymore <laughs> to see how the boy's death, uh, the father's death and the boy's injuries were avenged in the end by Ben. Yeah. So that's a story oh, wow. and it's also a tribute to my old friend Ben, my big yellow Labrador, oh, of whom oh. I was deeply fond and to oh. whom I think I did speak at times. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you'll buy it, I hope you'll enjoy it and I hope you'll pass it on to kids who I think will enjoy it too. Just that taste of mystery, a bit of magic and above all, especially for the kids, at the end, a bit of really good violence. <laughs> <laughs>
the recent um, announcement uh, changes it at all, really. Because the undertaking is that they would grant a referendum if there was another major transfer of power to the European Union. That doesn't have to be. It's all there in the treaties already. What has to be changed is the commitment to an ever closer union. Now that would not be a commitment to more power, that would be a commitment to less power. So I think, uh, as many people have identified, um, it's just a bit of puffery, uh, which will be blown on the winds before very long. Um, can't help wondering what Wedgie Ben would have said about it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you were young, could you imagine a, at a later time writing a book, or was it something that has just occurred for you to do? I think by vocation, I'm a wordsmith. And I don't know if you've ever watched a chap building a dry stone wall, but he'll have a big pile of stones there, all sorts of shapes and sizes, and he'll look at them, and he'll take them up one after the other, and fit them where they should be. That's what a wordsmith does. There's a great big pile of words, and I love taking them and fitting them together. It's what I've done all my life, and uh, <coughs> this is just really a new venture along that line. Um, and. Uh, I hope the wall is sound and that it won't fall over if you lean on it. <laughs> but, but that's where I come from. Um, no, I didn't think that I would ever write a work of fiction like this. But then, I didn't think I was going to write a cookery book until I realised that most people can't cook game. <laughs> and that they'd go into a butcher's shop and pay more for a rubber chicken than for a decent pheasant. So I had to do it, yeah. <laughs> and I had to do this too. <laughs> oh. Gentlemen here. Very really nice to meet you, Lord Tavid. Would you mind share your insights about your um, views about Chinese programs recently? I'm from China. So, sorry, could you speak up a bit? Could you say something about China? Your insights about China? Your about China? About the developments, yeah. I won't mention the fact that I'm told that sometimes is it true? They don't eat dogs, do they? <laughs> <laughs> the last time I was there was in uh, 1981, just in the aftermath of the Cultural Revolution. That I found was an enormously interesting experience because of the way in which the creative genius of China was coming to the fore. And I think you will know far better than me, but it strikes me that there's always been a problem for China that its greatest days have been when there's been a powerful emperor in Peking in order that the different groups and really nationalities within China will all work together in the same direction. And I found it very interesting there, the way in which the Chinese sense of humour and style, which is very much akin to the British, I think, was coming through. It started off at a great banquet in the, in the great hall of the people. And I was up as the principal guest on a table on a raised dais and way into the distance through the cigarette smoke for haze were dozens more tables. And as you all know, on such occasions, the food is put in plates along the centre of the table. And one's host puts the food onto your plate. Fortunately, I'm not too bad with chopsticks, but quite maliciously with a big smile, he kept giving me greater and greater challenges. Have you ever tried to pick up, with chopsticks, hard-boiled quail's eggs? <laughs> <laughs> and 
It was that sense of mischief which I loved. <laughs> and the last evening I was there, we went out to dinner, and I was surprised to be told that we were going to go to a restaurant because it had been the favourite restaurant of Her Late Majesty, the Dowager Empress. Suddenly, it was possible to talk about such things again. And as is the custom in China, I understand, my host made a speech before dinner. And it was rather a long speech, actually. And every now and again, the door from the kitchen would open and then close again. And eventually the door opened and a chap wearing chef's kit came out, came up behind my host, who was a senior minister in the Chinese government, put his hands on his shoulders, pushed him down in his seat, <laughs> and said something at which everybody laughed. And I said to my interpreter, what did he say? He said, the food is ready. Food is more important than politics, and it's getting spoiled. <laughs> and that was the leap which had made me made in China um, from the Cultural Revolution. I think now there are most enormous problems which are being faced because of the uh, problems in managing an economy which has grown at such a rate. And I think that there will be some problems now um, for China, but I hope that she will come through those, and in particular that the relationship both of trade and politics and cultural relations between us here and China will continue. Well, uh, thank you very much, everyone. I'm afraid time is our enemy. Um,